Hello, my name is Evelyn. I'm 38 years old and I was raised by a devoted single mother after my father died when I was in kindergarten. Despite our financial struggles, the three of us found joy and contentment in our small family unit. Growing up in these circumstances, I developed frugal habits that carried into adulthood, even when I earned a decent salary. I married Albert, a wealthy man whom I met through mutual friends. He was kind and introduced me to a lifestyle I had never imagined, but our marriage soon revealed deep differences in our views on money and gender roles. Albert envisioned a traditional home where I would be the homemaker, but I was committed to maintaining my career and financial independence. Before we married, Albert had hinted at his desire for me to take on traditional domestic roles. Still, I made it clear I wanted to continue working at least until we decided to start a family. I saw it as financially prudent and eventually he agreed, albeit reluctantly. Once married, the reality of juggling work and household responsibilities became overwhelming. I was a full-time employee, yet my days were filled with endless chores, leaving us little time to nurture our relationship. Albert, on the other hand, settled comfortably into the role of a traditional husband, contributing nothing to the household chores. He would come home to enjoy dinner and relax while I managed everything else. This imbalance began to strain our marriage, making me wonder if this was all there was to our union. Despite my growing dissatisfaction, I hesitated to express my feelings, fearing Albert might pressure me to quit my job. I had hoped that having children might improve our relationship, but as our connection waned, I doubted the feasibility of expanding our family. Feeling a sense of urgency, I finally broached the subject with Albert, suggesting we consider starting a family soon. His response was dismissive. Kids, you seem quite energetic for someone who's always tired from work. This interaction was a tipping point, and it wasn't long before my world was turned upside down. During a business trip, Albert unexpectedly announced his intention to divorce me. He had also secretly married his lover, and shockingly accused me of marrying him only for his money. He demanded that I relinquish any claim to our shared properties. Facing my indifferent husband, who had shown me nothing but disdain since our marriage, led to his unraveling and a rapid descent to rock bottom. Our confrontation opened my eyes to the harsh realities of our relationship and the challenging road ahead. Amidst our household duties and work responsibilities, I approached Albert about wanting to start a family. Although we hadn't been married for very long, being over 32 made me acutely aware of the biological clock women face. I explained to Albert that it was becoming increasingly difficult for me to conceive as I got older, and time was not on our side. However, Albert's response was dismissive. But if we have a child, you'll expect me to help out, right? You know I'm swamped with work and won't be able to contribute to child rearing. His outright refusal to participate in raising our future children, even before they were born, struck me as odd. I intended to handle it mostly on my own, but I hoped he would at least show some willingness to help, considering it would be his child too. His stark reply was, Child rearing is your job. I'm working to support the family, so I definitely won't help with the kids. You'll just end up complaining that I don't help, making me the bad guy. He even accused me of being conditioned to think that having many kids was normal because of my humble upbringing. We're not poor. We don't need kids, he concluded, shutting down the conversation and retreating to his room. Left alone in the living room, I was overwhelmed with tears. My desire to have children was not only rejected, but my background was mocked. After this confrontation, our relationship quickly deteriorated. We barely spoke, and the dream of expanding our family seemed even more unattainable, as I continued to manage both my career and our home. Working on significant projects at the office, I felt my connection with Albert growing even more distant. Then, one day, as I was about to leave for a business trip, he unexpectedly wished me well 
and hinted at a big surprise awaiting me upon my return. His uncharacteristic kindness momentarily revived a sliver of hope in me. However, that hope was crushed when I returned. The first shock was that I couldn't open the front door. Albert had changed the locks. The second was even more devastating. He announced our divorce, claiming he had forged my signature on the papers with a friend as a witness. Inside, he handed me a document to sign, which waived my rights to any property division. I protested the false accusations and insisted on a mutual renunciation of property rights, intending to document it publicly. Albert stubbornly revised the document on his computer, initiating a tense exchange. As I left our home, he continued to belittle my financial status and even threatened to discard my belongings. Several days later, Albert's urgent and flustered voice came through the phone. What have you done? He asked frantically. I haven't done anything, Albert. Why are you so upset? I responded, puzzled by his alarm. They just kicked me out of the apartment, he explained, his voice tense. You are still there? You know that's not allowed anymore. It's a new month, and technically you're trespassing, I pointed out calmly. But it's my place. Don't you remember? It was a company apartment I rented. I'm the leaseholder, so obviously you can't stay there now, he argued. That's ridiculous, Albert. How could you think it's all right to force me out without proper notice? I can't believe you didn't understand that as the leaseholder, you don't have absolute control, I said, trying to keep my composure. I thought I made it clear. You can't just change the locks on a rental property. It's not solely your house to alter at your whim, I continued, attempting to reason with him. You should have listened. It was my lease agreement. But regardless of that, the apartment manager is the actual owner. You can't alter the locks without their consent, he shot back, still misunderstanding his rights. Here's what you missed. I had already terminated the lease while you were busy changing the locks. I was permitted to stay there until the end of this month. I planned to return, but now you've illegally modified someone else's property, which might be seen as criminal damage. I informed him, hoping he'd grasp the severity of his actions. Wait, why terminate it so soon? Criminal damage? Is that why there are police at my door? I'm afraid to open it. Albert's voice cracked slightly. The police might be there, but it likely isn't for trespassing or criminal damage. You should speak with them. Just so you know, I reported you for independently filing the divorce papers. It appears you've committed forgery and used a private document fraudulently. Remember, divorce papers require mutual consent and authentic signatures, I explained sternly. As he absorbed this information, I continued, The divorce papers you filed are void and your supposed marriage to Judy can't legally proceed. How did I find out about Judy? Did you assume I was in the dark? I hired a detective agency to investigate your relationship with Judy thoroughly. Despite my hectic schedule at work and coordinating with the detectives, I discovered about your elaborate wedding ceremony. While I was supposedly on a business trip, I took leave from work, despite being swamped, to focus on gathering some crucial evidence and preparing documents. I had discovered that Albert was bringing Judy to our home, something I wouldn't have been able to uncover while juggling my regular work commitments. After confronting Albert with all the evidence I had collected, he was utterly speechless and sounded quite dejected over the phone. Then, in a desperate plea, he said, Please don't tell Judy that I'm divorced. Why would I mention that? There's no such fact to disclose, I replied coolly. Really? Thank you, he responded, a hint of relief in his voice. Are you confused? When did you think you became divorced? Those divorce papers you filed are invalid, remember? So legally, you're still my husband, not divorced, I clarified, ensuring he understood the gravity of the situation. What? So since you committed adultery while still legally my husband, Judy is now liable to pay compensation. I sent a demand for reparation to her house yesterday by express delivery. She didn't know you were married, right? At this point, I can't retract the claim, I explained, my voice firm. Albert was silent likely processing the implications. Judy hasn't contacted me yet, so maybe she hasn't received the letter. It should arrive soon. Should you be on the phone with me when you have to deal with the police as well? You're busy. 
I added a touch of sarcasm in my tone. I'll ignore the police. I won't be arrested. I'm going to Judy's house now to get the letter back before she or her family sees it, he blurted out, then hung up. I assumed he rushed straight to Judy's house to intercept the postman. I knew the endeavor would be futile since the letter was sent as registered mail addressed solely to Judy. Even if Albert waited for the postman, he wouldn't be able to receive it. A few hours later, a dejected Albert called me again. He recounted an awkward encounter. I was there when the postman arrived. Finally, I'll take that envelope, I told him. And who are you? You don't live here, right? The postman challenged. I'm practically a resident here since I'm married. I have the right to receive the mail, Albert argued, desperation in his voice. I see, but I can't give you this envelope. It's registered mail for Judy only. Give it to me! Albert demanded. Not. If you're so eager, ask Judy for permission, the postman replied, unmoved. Just then, Judy appeared, puzzled by the commotion. What's going on here? Oh, Albert, what's all this noise about? This is registered mail for you, Judy. This man insisted on taking it. Sorry for the disturbance, the postman explained, handing her the envelope. This unexpected revelation likely caused quite a stir, and I could only imagine the conversation that followed between Judy and Albert. On my way out, Judy confronted Albert, holding the envelope in confusion. What's this, Albert? A demand for reparation? You were married? What's going on here? Albert, visibly flustered, tried to cover up. Sorry, it's just, she's an ex-wife from a long time ago. I was embarrassed to admit I'm divorced. I'm sorry for keeping it a secret. But it's odd, isn't it? We haven't been dating long and a demand for reparation? If you were divorced before we started seeing each other, there shouldn't be any problem, right? Judy pressed on. Well, my ex-wife is, let's say, a bit unpredictable. Maybe she's demanding reparation out of spite because I got remarried, Albert replied, hoping to dismiss the situation. However, his excuse quickly fell apart. The envelope contained a letter I had written, along with my contact details. Judy, seeking clarity, called me directly. In our conversation, I laid everything out, the affair, the invalid divorce, and that they had even held a wedding ceremony while he was still legally married to me. Although they celebrated their union, the marriage registration hadn't been submitted yet. Albert had planned to submit it on April Fool's Day, so it was still pending. He likely delayed the process due to uncertainty about whether the divorce had been finalized. After being confronted with the truth, Albert hastily left Judy's house and, without any shame, contacted me again. We agreed to meet at a nearby cafe to discuss further. As soon as I arrived, Albert pleaded, Evelyn, please withdraw the reparation claim. Let's pretend we've been separated for a long time and are officially divorced now. I can apologize to Judy, claim I was secretly divorced, and maybe smooth things over. You think I'm desperate to stay married to you? I was planning to file for divorce anyway, but since you cheated, you'll pay reparation. I countered, firm in my decision. Just trying to extort money from me, huh? Typical of someone with a poor spirit, Albert snapped, reverting to insults. Depending on my response, everything can change. There's still an option where we don't divorce if I say no. You can't reject it, meaning you can't marry Judy, and your marital status will be exposed, I explained, laying out the consequences. Fine, I'll pay the reparation. Just divorce me now. Sign here, he said, resigning to the situation. And about property division? How much more do you want to take from me? The reparation should be enough. Remember, we agreed to waive property division, right? So let's make it official, he added, trying to limit his losses. All right, you're not as unreasonable as I thought. Thank you, he conceded. We then went to a public notary where we made a public document for reparation and property division, formally ending our ties and finalizing the necessary legalities. After finalizing everything at the public notary, we headed to City Hall to submit the divorce papers, officially ending our marriage. As we walked out, relieved, I exchanged some last words with Albert. I'm glad we don't have to deal with dividing property, I commented, trying to keep the conversation light. 
What are you saying? I'm the one who benefits from that. By the way, do you even have assets after paying me reparation? Judy will also claim damages. She mentioned charging you for the wedding expenses, Albert retorted, his tone dismissive. That's impossible. I'm marrying Judy. She can't claim that. We're divorced now, so there should be no problem, he continued, clearly still entangled in his narrative. Still living in a fantasy, Albert? You committed marriage fraud. You had a wedding while still legally married to me. Do you think Judy still believes your story? I asked, incredulous at his denial. Marriage fraud? That's ridiculous. Judy will believe me? He insisted, though doubt seemed to creep into his voice. Believe that if you want, but I heard from Judy directly. Also, weren't the guests at your wedding paid actors? You still owe them, you know, I added, revealing more of his deception. You know about that? I haven't paid them yet. What does it matter to you? You could have just taken property division and been better off, he snapped, frustrated. That's what I wanted to tell you. Even if we had divided property, you would have benefited more, I explained calmly, ready to correct his misunderstanding. What are you talking about, poor woman? Your family is poor, and you only make $210,000 a year, right? Even if you got a raise, it would be barely $25,000. You don't have any property, Albert scoffed, continuing to underestimate me. You keep calling me poor, so I thought you might be mistaken. Yes, my salary was indeed $130,000, but you know I work for a foreign company, right? It seems you have no real interest in me, but I became a director of the U.S. division. It's not $130,000 per year, but per month. $210,000 per month, making my annual income $2.52 million, I corrected him, revealing the true extent of my financial success. You're still bad with numbers. How do you manage to keep a job? It's $200,000 a year, Albert mumbled, confused. $200,000? That can't be true? Of course, I haven't had the chance to spend such an amount, so I've been saving it for the future. The savings from before our marriage aren't part of the property division, but there's still a considerable amount since our marriage. I could have received half of that in the property division. You were my husband, after all, I pointed out, dismantling his assumptions. I'll get the divorce papers corrected. Are you okay after all the contempt? Do you think I'd gladly undo the divorce if you had that much money? You don't need to claim reparation, right? He asked, his voice a mix of disbelief and resignation. After finalizing the divorce and dealing with the fallout, Albert looked bewildered and a little desperate. It's just a small amount for you. He tried to downplay the reparation for the mental anguish he had caused me. He who laughs at one cent will weep for one cent. I responded firmly. This reparation is for the emotional distress you caused me. Honestly, I would like to claim more. And since it's official now, make sure you pay it, even if it's in installments. I'll be left with nothing. And don't think about going back to that apartment. Your belongings have already been moved to your parents' house by now. You thought I had few belongings, but that was because I had already moved most of them. Were you really that indifferent to notice? I continued, pointing out his oversight. I can have so little, so now I have to go back to my parents' house? They don't know anything yet, do they? Let me explain. Don't say anything. I've already told them everything. It's only right to explain why we're divorcing. Oh, and your father said don't ever step over our threshold again, I said, cutting him off. Overwhelmed, he slumped down, and I left the cafe. Later, I heard he caused a scene at the police station. Ignoring my advice, he returned to the apartment, sitting aimlessly in the space until the manager called the police and he was taken away. It wasn't clear if it was for obstructing public duties, trespassing, or for the falsified divorce papers. Eventually, his parents took responsibility for him. After speaking with me and learning about Judy, they decided that apologizing and paying damages to Judy's family was the priority. They went to Judy's house, knelt in front of her family, and settled everything without pressing charges for marriage fraud, even covering the wedding expenses. I had expected them to sue, so it was disappointing when they didn't. Therefore, I decided to pursue legal action against him for forging the divorce papers.
Albert offered a settlement, but I didn't withdraw the lawsuit. I didn't want him to think that everything could be resolved with money. I wanted him to be convicted and truly understand the gravity of his actions, even if it cost time and money. I handed everything over to my lawyer, so it wasn't too burdensome for me. Despite it taking time, Albert was exposed for his actions and the marriage fraud. His company couldn't keep him on after he was detained by the police and subsequently absent without leave. He was eventually fired. He ended up living at his parents' home, working all day at a relative's construction company. His father took all his earnings, leaving him without any income. Albert's parents turned out to be more stringent than I anticipated. They compensated me for the emotional damage and paid Judy for her losses, determined to have Albert work exhaustively until he had repaid everything. He ended up living in a basic shed-like structure without electricity, subsisting on just $1.06 a day for food, an amount deducted directly from his meager earnings. They even planned to ask him to leave once he settled his debts, a tough turn of events after his years of apparent ease. In the meantime, after the divorce was finalized, I was offered a position at our company's head office overseas. Accepting the offer, I moved abroad, a decision that eased my worries about Albert possibly seeking help from me or harboring resentment. Abroad, I assumed work would dominate my life for a while. However, life took a pleasant turn. I soon entered into a new relationship. I am now dating a foreign executive at our head office. Things progressed well and I'm currently pregnant with plans to get married soon. I have been open with him about my past and my tumultuous relationship with my ex-husband and he has been nothing but supportive and understanding. We've discussed our plans. I'll take maternity leave and later return to work with him taking paternity leave and committing to co-parenting. This cultural perspective on sharing parenting responsibilities was refreshing and showed me a different way of life. Having endured so much turmoil with my ex-husband, I finally feel like I am on the path to true happiness and confidence, building the happy family I always dreamed of. My experience has taught me that while divorce is not always the desired outcome, enduring silence is never a virtue. It's crucial to realize that honest discussions can lead to meaningful resolutions, and sometimes divorce is a necessary step toward a better life.